Good morning. Yeah. Amen. Hey, let's uh, stand up for, uh, let's do some praise and worship here. They said, uh, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. Let's rejoice in his name, for the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah, Jesus. I believe in the blood of Jesus. The wash is white as snow. I believe that the power of the gospel still makes a broken whole. I believe that the curse of sin was broken when they rolled away that stone. I believe, I believe, I believe. As I bow before you. You may be seated. That's a great song to start our service here this morning. Hopefully uh, you enjoyed that. Thank, thank you for Chad and the team for leading us here this morning. I'm going to invite uh, Allison up as she's coming up. I want to mention uh, Lunch Bunch, uh, which is this week, two days, Tuesday. So if you are 55 and older, you qualify. Uh, we, we have lunch, uh, have a good time there, uh, have fellowship. Uh, it, it's all the way back uh, in the gym at the end of the hall here. So whether you enter this door or back there, uh, that's where it's at. So if you are 55 and older, we would love to have you for lunch on Tuesday. Uh, you can call the church office. You can go to the Welcome Center uh, to get a ticket for that just so that we know how much food we need to make uh, and who's, who's going to be there. So we're excited for that. Hopefully you're able to make that. 
Allison? Well, hello, cruisers. So we have officially started decoration making for Bible school. So we are, we got a lot done on this epic adventure that the kids are going to be going on this summer. So announcement real quick that in our bulletin, there are more decorating sessions um, that are coming up. And uh, the one that needs to be changed um, is Saturday, next Saturday, the 20th. We're going to move the start time till 3.30 p.m. due to uh, conflict and scheduling. So question for anybody out there that might have a big umbrella, like one that you sit out on your patio that you might need to replace. I could use one of those if you have one you're willing to part with. What I do need is um, the base, the heavy base that weights it down. Um, I have one umbrella, but I need the base for it. We're going to turn them into some pretty cool huts. So if you can part with that, please catch me sometime um, and let me know. So thank you. And I think that's it. So hope to see you guys coming to help. You'll recognize those of us that were there yesterday by the uh, colorful paint under our nails. So thank you. I uh, just want to, you have several things in your, in your bulletin, lots of stuff going on. There's stuff with Starting Point, ESL, uh, upcoming prayer and praise night, things like that. So I would in, invite you to look at your bulletin uh, and, and go through that and, and be a part of stuff. But I want to draw your attention to one more thing, which is this insert, sort of colorful, uh, that says, serve your world, one body in Christ. And so this, this here, you'll see the back is full of information there. That's coming up here on May 5th. So instead of having a normal church service, as we've done the last few years, one Sunday out of the year, we go out into the community with people. Uh, and so we serve them uh, in some capacity. And it looks different depending on what service opportunity is there that we participate in. And so there are several. And you see those outlined on the back a little bit, a little bit what the day is going to look like. We meet at the park at 9. We have a lunch at the park afterwards and fellowship, reflection time, uh, some worship there. So if, if you are interested in, in being a part of that, we, we would love to have you be a part of that. We're not the only church uh, who's doing it. There's been a team that has been putting together the... Uh, the service opportunities and the things that are going to take place on that day. And so we're looking forward to it. We're excited for it. We want you to be a part of it. So City Church is going to be a part of that. Nazarene Church will have uh, some others as well. So we're excited. We want you to be there. We have a sign-up sheet out at the Welcome Center, so just around the corner, uh, 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 right outside that door. Uh, just there so we can know who is going to be uh, coming, how many to expect. There will be uh, T-shirts for that, so you'll want to sign up with your shirt size. Uh, and then just sign up for one of these uh, opportunities. You're not locked into it, but it just gives us an idea of how the distribution will, will work. It will make things a little bit quicker and more streamlined on that day so that we could get straight to the service opportunities. We don't want to dawdle too long at the park because we want to be with people. Uh, so we, we have several opportunities. It'll look a little bit different than last year. You'll see fewer places that we're going to, and that's an intentional decision because we have been able to access certain parts of the community that we weren't able to last year and previous years. And so you'll see that we're going to one, one of the trailer parks. We'll go to another one as well. Uh, we're able to get into the nursing homes and serve these people who are often overlooked that if we just drive around or are part of the community, we often miss uh, these people. And we want to build relationships with those who don't know Jesus, no matter where they are. Uh, and so we get to touch base with some of those people in our community. We're excited for that. So we want you to be part of it again. Uh, you'll have the information on the back of your uh, insert here. Post it somewhere. Uh, pay, take note of that date, May 5th, which is a few weeks from today, three weeks or, or so, uh, and sign up after the service. So why don't we stand and continue to worship our God this morning?
upon a cross. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. We live for you. Oh, well, let's do that again. Worthy of every song, Lord. Worthy.
You may be seated. But if the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones came with glory, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, fading as it was, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. For indeed, what had glory, in this case, has no glory because of the glory that had surpassed it. For if that which fades away was with glory, much more that which remains is in glory. Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness <clears throat> in our speech and are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away. But their minds were hardened, for until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we have built our life on you. Lord, we have turned to you and the sacrifice that you have given for us. And Lord, we praise you this morning. Lord, we believe in what you have done. We have cast off all that were our former bonds so that we might trust fully in you and your sacrifice. Lord, as we have been as we have heard last week, as we will hear again today, as we hear these coming weeks, Lord, of the glory that awaits us. Lord, may we not forget the glory that is with us now. Lord, that you are with us, that we can behold your face. Lord, though dimly, Lord, though we see in part, Lord, we still see you. Lord, we have seen you, and we are grateful for that. Lord, as we hear about what you have prepared for us, as you have said that you are preparing a place for us, what will that be like, Lord Jesus? What is that going to be like? As we hear what you have already revealed to us, Lord, may we have life breathed anew into us. Lord, would we be encouraged anew? Would we have a fresh wind of your spirit, Lord, to face the difficulties that are awaiting us this week? Lord, the traps that are before us, that the devil and the world have laid for us, the temptations, Lord, would we have our eyes fixed firmly on you, Lord, seeing your face, Lord, and we look forward to that day when we will indeed see you truly face to face, not dimly anymore, Lord, but perfectly. Lord, we look forward to that day when our eyes will be replaced with eyes that can see you in your glorified state. We look forward to that day when our hands and our feet will be able to be in your presence because we have experienced being given a new body. We have experienced a resurrection unto new life. We've been glorified. And so, Lord, we look forward to that day. Lord, we ask that you would help us to see our situations now, even in light of that. Lord, that that day is coming and we have this sure and steadfast hope before us. And yet, Lord, we don't want to be the kind of people who are so focused on heaven that we are no earthly good. Lord, but you have called us to be here, some longer than others. Lord, you know the day when each one of us will meet you. And so, Lord, we pray that the time that we have been given, Lord, that it would be fully devoted to you. Lord Jesus, that we could say with Paul, to live is Christ, but to die is to gain. Lord, would that be our hearts even today and this week? Lord, we lift up several burdens from our 
church family. Lord, we grieve with those who grieve. Lord, we want to bear one another's burdens. And we are called to pray for one another. And so, Lord, we pray this morning for Chris Kuzma as he had his surgery. And, Lord, as far as we can tell, it has went well. Uh, by all reports, it has went very well. And so, Lord, we know that he has a long recovery. We know he has several months where he can't, he can't lift anything, Lord. But we pray that you would help him to a full and speedy recovery. We ask, Lord, that just as you touched those when you were here on earth, that you would touch his body and bring healing to him. Lord, we ask that you would strengthen his family, help them to encourage him, help us to encourage him, Lord, as he goes through this. And we pray that our faith would be strengthened as well. Lord, we want to lift up also Russ Maliki this morning. Lord, we pray for him. We want to continue to remember him as he recovers uh, from his injury, Lord. And we know that, that he fell this week. Lord, pray that there was no lasting damage from that. Lord, we pray that you would speed his recovery. Lord, continue to work through him and continue to work through his family, Lord, as they seek to honor you in this process, in this trial that they're going through, Lord, but also all that you've put before them. Lord, would they continue to have a joyful spirit as only could be from you, Lord, such that those who are with them look at them and, and see your working in their life. Lord, would they encourage us through their faith? Would we encourage them, uh, Lord, in these coming months? Would we not forget them in the trial they're going through? Lord, we pray for others, Lord, here who are recovering or who are dealing with illnesses, dealing with sicknesses, dealing with stresses, financial stresses, Lord, work stress, family stress. Lord, we, we, we don't know all the details of all those, but you do. And so, Lord, we pray that you would reach in and do what only you can do, Lord Jesus. Bring healing. Bring spiritual healing. Bring emotional healing. Lord, heal relationships and heal our bodies. Lord, we believe that you are our healer. Lord, healer of our bodies and healer of our souls. Would you heal us today? Lord, as we hear from your word, we ask that you would again be honored by the words that you have given to Pastor Steve and that our hearts would be submissive to what you have to say. Lord, we want to trust you again this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, good morning, everybody. So good to see you here this morning. I've enjoyed worshiping with you here uh, for the last few minutes. You know, I had something uh, kind of funny happen to me at our uh, early service at our downtown location. Books. I really uh, enjoy that service. And uh, we sang the song, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. You know that song? I have decided to follow Jesus. Yeah, we sang that song. And uh, it came to mind that um, we used to sing that song when I was a teenager in youth group. And uh, suddenly I realized that if a song that you sang in youth group is now in a hymn book, you can no longer deny that you're old. <laughs> that ship has sailed. You, 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 can't get, you can't get away from that. Uh, it, it depressed me a little bit. I'm like, oh, man, there's a song I sang when I was a teenager in youth group, and it's in a hymn book now. Yet another reason to uh, really look forward to heaven. Uh, and that's uh, in a couple of weeks when we talk about what are, what are we going to be like physically in heaven? What are our... Are we going to have a body? And what's that body going to be like? And, and how will it be different than the one that we have uh, today? And I can tell you one of the reasons uh, that it'll be different is uh, because it will not get old. And that'll be a cool thing, right? Hey, if you happen to be new or visiting today, super glad that you're here. Uh, my name's Steve McKnight. I'm one of the pastors here. And we are currently in a series uh, about heaven. This is actually week two out of eight, and in the coming weeks, we're going to glean some wonderful truths from Scripture 
about the place that Jesus said in John chapter 14, I am going to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again to take you to be with me where I am also. By the way, if you have questions about heaven, you, there's a comment uh, card, in the, a connection card in the bulletin. Just uh, write it on there and drop it off at the Welcome Center as you leave. And uh, I am all curious about the question. I got some great questions last week, and I'm going to try to address those. One of them I'm addressing in the message. Sometimes I'll address them in the message. But on week seven, we're just going to uh, take a bunch of those questions and say, hey, what can we understand from Scripture to answer some of these questions? So if you have one, uh, I'm all ears. And you know, I think that as we move through this series, that we are going to be awestruck by the descriptives of what heaven will look like. We'll seek to imagine what is heaven, what is life actually going to be like in heaven. We'll seek to understand what will we be like in heaven. We're going to try to understand what is society going to be like in heaven. Is there, is there going to be a society and, and what's that going to look like and what's my role in that going to be? But as astounding as those things are, I think our subject matter for today is perhaps the most remarkable quality of heaven that Christians will marvel at. And that quality is found in our key verses of the day. Revelation 22, verses 3 through 4. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God... And of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Would you pray with me? And we're going to just jump into that. Lord, what an amazing truth we're going to look at today. And I know that in my human frailty, I, I cannot communicate the wonder of this reality. So Holy Spirit... Would you show up in a big way in each one of our lives? Would you speak to us? Would you make your word become living and active? Would you use it to pierce into our hearts? And may we hear directly from you this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In heaven, there will be no more curse. That's astounding to me. People who are not awed by the future provision of having this curse of sin removed do not fully understand what it means to live under the curse today. You know, it's a little bit like Bob Eden, who was born blind, and he lived most of his life in complete darkness. And then at the age of 51, a skilled surgeon was able to perform a very complicated surgery, and suddenly Bob Eden could see for the very first time. He found it overwhelming, as you can imagine, right? He said, I would never have dreamed that yellow is so yellow. He said, I don't have the words. I'm amazed by yellow. But red is my favorite color. I just can't believe red. I can see the shape of the moon. And I like nothing better than seeing a jet plane flying across the sky, leaving a vapor trail. And of course, sunrises and sunsets. You could never know how wonderful everything is. And he's right, you know. For those of us who have had eyesight for all of our lives, we could not hope to understand the wonder that Bob experiences every day now. In just a moment, a most remarkable moment, Bob Eden went from being totally in the dark due to blindness to being able to see everything around him. He had to have people tell him, no, that, that's yellow. <laughs> that color there is red because he didn't have any reference for what yellow and red were before. He could now recognize his loved ones, not just by hearing their voice, but by seeing their faces. He could enter a room, and everything that was in that room that before had been an obstacle to him, now he could, he could see them. He could experience sunrises and sunsets and birds and flowers and the oceans and the mountains in a way that he had never been able to experience them before. In just a moment, life became an entirely new adventure for Bob. 
and his life would never be the same, right? Never. And just like you and I would have trouble relating to Bob's experience of being able to see after he'd been blind for 51 years because we've always been able to see. It's difficult for us to fully imagine what life is going to be like in heaven someday with the curse of sin removed because we have lived our entire life under the curse. We don't have a frame of reference to fully imagine a world without sin. We can speculate about it. We can, we can wish for it. We can dream about it. But what will that be like? No curse. Because our life experiences, they've always incorporated the court, the curse. What would a world be like that has never experienced the taint of sin? It's almost beyond imagination. Genesis 3 gives us the account of when the curse of sin was applied to our lives. Because it records the moment in history when the curse entered our world. And since that moment, his humanity and all of creation have existed under that applied curse. I want to quickly point out four effects on our life as a result of the curse of sin from Genesis chapter 3. Here's the first one. The consequences of the curse brought shame. Verses 8 through 11 say this, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? So the curse, it brought shame into our lives, shame because of disobedience, shame because of the failure to live up to God's standards. Have you ever felt and experienced shame in your life? Shame for a choice that you made, shame over something that you said, shame over something that you have done. We've all experienced that. Before the curse, shame didn't exist. Here's a second consequence of the curse. It brought, ju- it brought punishment. Verses 16 through 18 said, To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. What we learn so early on about sin here, even in the third chapter of the Bible, is that sin always has consequences. And part of the consequences of sin was judgment or punishment. The pain of childbearing, the difficulty of hard work to survive. Today, you and I still live in a world that is experiencing the judgment or the the punishment over sin. Here's a third consequence of the curse. It brought death. Verse 19 says, By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Another consequence of sin is death. God warned Adam and Eve that if they ate from the tree of life, that it would bring death. They chose to disobey God's directive. Death entered the world, and it brought with it illness. It brought with it disease. Today, we obviously still experience death, right? We experience disease. We have to deal with injury. Those things were not present before the curse. And then lastly, the uh, consequences of the curse brought spiritual separation from God. Verses 23 through 24 say, so the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim with a flaming sword flashing back and forth 
to guard the way to the tree of life. You know, before the curse, man and women had an intimate face-to-face relationship with God. He walked with them. He had conversations with them. He gave them instructions and responsibilities. But the curse of sin caused a rift in that relationship because now sin had entered humanity and God still remained holy. And we could just look at these four things from Genesis chapter 3, these four consequences of sin, and we can see that the curse was devastating to humanity. It was devastating. It brought shame. It brought judgment. It brought death. It, it brought separation from the Creator. And without the intervention of God, the curse would have remained permanent. But the curse of sin not only affects people, it affects all of creation. God said that the very ground was cursed. Remember that? That the ground now produces thorns and thistles. The act of childbirth, that's a violent act. Paul wrote about this in Romans chapter 8 when he stated, For the creation was subject to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, or chose to sin, and hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay. All of creation, as we know it, suffers under the curse. Creation is decaying. Disease, hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, pandemics are a result of the curse. So there's a physical component to the curse, and there's a spiritual component, and the results, I think we could all agree on, have been devastating. That's the bad news. But thankfully, the Bible contains some good news because God always had a plan to remove the curse. Randy Alcorn said this in his book, Heaven. I love this quote. He said, the curse is real, but temporary. Jesus is the cure for the curse. The Bible tells us that before the foundation of the world, God had a plan to redeem all that he created. Ephesians 1, 4 says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. 1 Peter chapter 1 says he was chosen before, that's Jesus, chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him so that your faith and hope are in God. God had a plan before the curse of sin was ever applied to our world to remove it. Listen to how the Apostle Paul expands on this teaching from Galatians chapter 3. He says, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Yikes. Time out. See what Paul's saying there, right? He's saying if you can't obey the entire law of the Bible, all of those commandments, if you can't fully obey them, you are cursed because of that law. You you were not able to attain that standard of sinless perfection, and you're cursed. And we can just look at the Ten Commandments and go, well, it's tough to even follow those ten. But then we understand in the gospel that Jesus even expounded upon that, right? He said, I, I, I tell you, <laughs> you say you shall not commit murder, but I'm going to tell you, if you've hated your brother, you've committed murder in your heart. Whew. Bad news. Let's continue. So Paul says, clearly, No one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Can you wrap your head around that? Paul is saying that Jesus himself became the very thing that we were cursed with. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. 
He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Grab this. How is the curse of sin removed? Through the sacrifice of Christ alone. Period. Paul was expressing that in Galatians 3. He goes, you can't do this on your own. It's impossible. Nobody can be good enough. Nobody can be self-righteous enough. It's only in Christ who allowed himself to become the curse so that the curse could be removed from us. God did not ignore sin, death, and the curse, but he had a plan from the foundation of the world to defeat it. Jesus redeemed us. Or he bought us back from the curse of sin by becoming the very curse of sin himself. And only a holy, sinless God could be that perfect sacrifice necessary for the curse to be broken from the human soul. And our faith in Christ breaks the bondage of the curse. And not only does Jesus remove the curse of sin from our lives, but he turns that curse, this is mind-blowing, into a blessing. Look at what Paul wrote in verse 14. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham, we don't have time to just pull all that apart, but it's huge, might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. By faith we receive the Holy Spirit in our life. Why is that a big deal? Why is that a big deal? Paul told the church in Ephesus why in Ephesians chapter 1. He said, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Woo! Deep breath. I've hammered you with a ton of scripture there in the last 10 minutes. But it's so important for us to understand what the Bible tells us about the curse of the sin so that we can understand how to be freed from that curse and so that we can understand that because that is so necessary for us to understand then how we can receive the blessings of heaven someday. When you place your faith in Jesus, the curse that was upon you has been applied to him. And the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life guarantees the blessing of eternal life in heaven. That's really good stuff, isn't it? Isn't it? You better believe it. Woo, that's all background so that I can finally get to our key thought of the day here. <laughs> here it is. The removal of the curse of sin by Christ allows God's blessings to flow in heaven. Couldn't happen otherwise. God planned from before the creation of the world to turn the curse into a blessing. Listen to Jesus' words on that from the parable of the sheep and the goats. Matthew 25, he says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. If you are a child of God, those are the first words you are going to hear when you walk through the gates of heaven. I believe that you'll weep for joy before Jesus wipes the tears from your eyes. Because I believe in that moment we are going to fully, for the first time, really understand what it means that we were cursed, but now we are blessed. Because you are going to lay eyes on the glorified, risen Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, I... uh, I love that song, Here I Am to Worship. Someday that's probably going to show up in a hymn book. (laughs) Watch out, you younger people. There's a line in that song I'm not sure I agree with, though. That one that says, and I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. Maybe not now. But when you lay eyes on the risen, glorified Jesus for the first time, you're going to know. You're going to know. You're going to experience that in a way that we don't experience it here on planet Earth. And the first wonder of heaven will be the knowledge that the curse has been lifted 
in exchange for the blessings of a new heaven and a new earth all through the work of Jesus Christ. And just as God and people are reconciled in Christ, so too will the dwelling places of God and people be reconciled in the new heaven and the new earth. More on that next week. So Jesus suffered so that he could make all things new. He said that himself in Revelation 21. He said, he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. What's he saying there? He goes, oh, John, you might have missed some of this stuff about end times because we are all over the place. But don't you miss this. What I'm telling you here, you can bank on it. When the curse is removed, the ground will no longer cause us painful toil. But instead, we will enjoy the blessings of caring for a new earth. When the curse is removed, the ground will no longer produce thorns and thistles because of humanity's failure. Instead, it will affect the blessings of the created, creator God and all of his glory. When the curse is removed, we will no longer return to the ground in death, but we will enjoy life everlasting. And when the curse is removed, we will no longer be separated from God's presence, but he will live among us and we will see his face. With the curse of sin removed forever, Christians will be able to enjoy the blessings of heaven forever. I want to look at four blessings that we're going to experience in heaven, kind of leapfrogging off Genesis chapter 3, kind of twisting that around and looking at it from the positive side. Here's the first blessing of heaven. No more sin. What will that be like? No more sin. No more hate. No more lust. No more idolatry. No more racism. What, what will that be like to live in a society where there's no more sin? You know, some people might think that since Adam and Eve chose to sin, and incidentally, so did Lucifer then perhaps we might be capable of sinning in heaven. You know, sin brought shame and punishment to them. Might that happen to us in heaven? Have you ever wondered that? Have you ever wondered, like, eh, okay, I want to get to heaven, but what if I, you know, what if I sin while I'm there? Have you ever, have you ever, maybe you haven't. I've wondered that in my life. I used to worry about it, as a matter of fact. I think, what if I get to heaven and I blow it? I'm on the J316 bypass. And someone cuts me off. And I get ticked off and I blow on a horn. I call him a jerk. And then they think, oh no, I blew it. I'm going to get kicked out. Like one sin and I'm out. <laughs> so let's set the record straight right now. Will we be capable of sinning in heaven? No. No. You will not. Listen to this verse from Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. It might be one of the best verses in the Bible. It says of Jesus, He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Why? For the old order of things has passed away. <laughs> For the old order of things has passed away. Let me ask you a question. What has caused death and mourning and crying and pain? Sin, right? Sin. That's what's caused that. Sin will be gone. In Revelation 21, 27, it says this about heaven. Nothing impure will ever enter it. If you're taking notes with me, circle the word ever. ever. <laughs> Nothing impure will ever enter it. Nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. In heaven, sin will not exist couple of big reasons for that. One of the first ones is this. There will be no temptation in heaven. Revelation 20.10 says this. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever. 
Yes! I don't, maybe I'm wrong in reveling in that, okay, because I, I know the torture and torment forever. But I think of all the heartache, all the pain, everything that Satan has caused in this world for thousands of years, everything he's caused in your life, everything he's caused in our society, everything he's caused in my life. And someday, according to the Bible, he is going to get his. God's going to be just. There can be no, if God is just, he has to act against injustice. Right? And it's not going to be this huge, prolonged battle. I'm not swearing here. God is literally going to tell Satan, go to hell. That's all it's going to take. There will be no temptation in heaven because Satan will be removed from the equation. And since he's banished there, he can't influence people to sin. You might debate me on this thought here. We're going to try to unpack it in a couple of weeks here. But I don't think in heaven, at least initially, that we're going to forget the ugliness of sin. Uh, I, I think we'll understand how it's affected us and how it's affected the world. But I do know that we will have the ability to sin removed from us. Because we will forever be in the presence of the resurrected and glorified King of Kings. And sin will not exist because temptation will not exist. And then here's the second big reason why sin will not exist. And it's because our righteousness is found in Jesus Christ's righteousness. And if Jesus can't sin, we won't be able to either. So Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, verse 19, For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners. Okay, Paul's going all the way back to Genesis 3 that we just looked at. So also the obedience of the one man, through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. (laughs) The theologian Paul Helm wrote, The freedom of heaven then is the freedom from sin. Not that the believer just happens to be free from sin, but that he is so constituted or reconstituted that he cannot sin. He doesn't want to sin, and he does not want to want to sin. What an incredible blessing we will receive in heaven because the old order of things, sin, has passed away, and our righteousness is found in the righteousness of Jesus Christ that can never fail. That's worth a hallelujah. Right? That's worth that. We can just say, can I, I can't sin. He can't. I can't. Because of him. And it's all because of Jesus and the work he did as our atoning sacrifice. We have to understand that. Jesus and the work that he did on the cross is what makes the situation in heaven different than Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were innocent before they chose to sin, but they'd never been made righteous in Christ. That's why our situation in heaven is different from theirs in the garden. And remember, God's plan from before the foundation of the world was to make us righteous in Christ. This isn't a backup plan. God didn't go, oh, man, I can't believe that. Adam, they did that. He ate them from that tree. I told him I'd do it. They did it. No, he knew that was coming. His plan was for the end result that people in Christ are going to experience someday in heaven. Hebrews 10 says this, for by one sacrifice... He has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Well, if you're taking notes, circle forever. Forever. I don't know about you, but I, I look at this blessing and I go, Phew. you know, it just, it takes pressure off me. It says, oh, okay, I'm not going to have to perform because I'm in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Here's a second blessing in heaven, and it's a heavenly inheritance. You know, under the curse, Adam and Eve, and through them all people, experienced judgment and punishment for their sin. There were consequences of pain and toil. But in heaven one day, when the curse of sin is removed, Christians are going to experience the blessing 
of an inheritance that's gifted by God. Peter wrote about that in 1 Peter chapter 1. He said, praise be to God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. What will that inheritance be? Well, I think in part we can think about, well, what does inheritance look like here in our world today? Randy Alcorn in his book in heaven writes this, when an earthly father dies, he bequeaths his estate to his offspring. His children are heirs. To what? To the father's property. If he owned land, they become landowners. If he was a king, they are heirs to his entire kingdom. So we will, in part, inherit the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of the new earth. We're going to have roles in the function of that kingdom under the rule and the direction of Jesus. More on that in a couple of weeks. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12 says this, Giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. Our inheritance is the kingdom. And like I said, we'll look at that in a couple more weeks. I wish we could look at all this stuff more in depth, but we don't have time for that right now. Actually, I better speed up. I got two more. You ready? The blessing of in heaven of no death, pain, and suffering. We know that the curse brought with it death, pain, and suffering. God told Adam and Eve of the consequences of the choice to disobey him. So one of the blessings in heaven will be the removal of the consequences of sin. We looked at this verse earlier from Revelation chapter 21. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. So we'll live forever in heaven because there will no, be no death. That makes sense, right? If we can't die, we're going to live forever. There'll be no pain, there'll be no suffering, there'll be no illness, there'll be no broken relationships, there'll be no uh, causes of, of, of living under addiction or, or isolation or anxiety or depression. Your best day in life today here on planet earth will not begin to compare to an average day in heaven someday. Sorry I keep teasing you, but more on that in a couple of weeks. Here's the last one. The blessing in heaven of the presence of God. Adam and Eve's choice to sin brought with it the curse, and with the curse it brought with it banishment from the Garden of Eden. God's relationship with humanity changed when sin entered into their lives. And even though we enjoyed a, enjoy a restored relationship with God through Jesus, currently it's only a partial restoration because we're still not physically present with Him. But the blessing of heaven will be that we will be physically present with him. He will be with his people. Revelation 21 verse 3 says, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And he will dwell with him. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Where I am. Right? Someday in heaven, you will see Jesus. You'll see him when you worship him. Someday in heaven, you're going to serve Jesus. He's going to give you those instructions himself. Someday, you're going to hear Jesus speak. You're going to eat with Jesus. You're going to watch Jesus interact with others and with yourself. There will be a face-to-face, -face, intimate relationship with God that even Moses didn't enjoy. Because he will be eternally present with his people. Revelation 21.7 says, Those who are victorious will inherit all this. And I will be their God, and they will be my children. I think it's 
possible to intellectually understand the idea of the curse of sin being removed. We can formulate a theological position on that by studying God's word. But what will that truly mean for us? What will that truly, that experience truly be like? I think it's a little bit beyond our current imagination. Remember our key verse? No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and His servants will serve Him. They will see His face. And His name will be on their foreheads. His name will be on their foreheads. Not the mark of the beast. Not the people who chose to serve Satan or the world. Not sins that we've committed in our life. We're not going to have idolatry on our forehead. We're going to have the name of the risen Savior. My favorite Christmas hymn speaks of what I've been talking about this morning. Do you know which one I'm talking about? My favorite Christmas hymn is Joy to the World. I think I got that. Can we throw that up there? That's the third verse. No more, let's sin. Sing it with me. And sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings known. Far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found, far as, far as the curse is found. Amen. Stand up. Thank you, Jesus.
see, you have to understand Jesus' desire to take a curse that's been applied to your life and to flip it to a blessing. And that simply happens by placing your faith in him as your Lord and Savior. You just have to come to the end of yourself and admit that you're a sinful person, that you've done things wrong, that you need to experience forgiveness so that you can match God's, so that you can be, you know, uh, um, approved by, by God and through the blood and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so you have to come to the place where you say, yeah, I'm, I I'm, I'm fall short of your glorious standard, God, and I need forgiveness. And it's seeking that forgiveness and then it's placing your trust in him to say, I know you died for me. You died on the cross for me so that I could experience all the blessings that you want for me in life. And you put your confidence, your faith in that, that you can't figure it out on your own, but that you don't need to because he figured it out for you. Jude says this, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy because the curse is lifted. To the one only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Go with God today. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour